<laughs> yeah. Yeah, they should have a countdown. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to another um, a beginner's uh, fly fishing uh, seminar with uh, Awkward and Clueless. Erica is awkward because <laughs> that's the name of her podcast, The Awkward Angler, which is, which is a great podcast. And uh, I'm Tom Rosenbauer. And I'm clueless because I am clueless uh, many times on the water. So um, we want, want you to know that um, no matter how long you've been fishing, there are always times on the water when you're going to feel awkward or and or clueless. So <laughs> get used to it because it's never going to go away. But we're going to try to we're going to try to um, try to eliminate a few of those uncomfortable moments for you by um, by giving you some tips. What are we going to talk about today, Erica? Well, I've, you know, I've actually been teaching a good friend how to fly fish and she just got her first rod today. And so we were out on the water earlier this morning testing it out and, you know, just kind of, she's got a lot of questions about what do I need to bring to the water? How do I know where mm -hmm. to fish? Um, you know, and how do I set this up? And she's a left-handed person, which I didn't think about. So all these little nuances and stuff of when you get to the water and um, what, what the heck to do next <laughs> when you're there. Yeah, we should definitely talk about that right and left hand business yeah mm -hmm. yeah that's what i had up my sleeve <laughs> okay all right and you had something before we get started that you had something you wanted to um discuss with people Oh, you know, I was just thinking, you know, when I go to an area where I want to fish, I like to do a lot of self-reflection. I like to know, you know, not only uh, is this public or private waters, you know, um, you know, because we got to be mindful of all, all of that. Um, I also like to use a lot of public lands, you know, and kind of figure out where I can fish um, for free, <laughs> you know, or, or, or at least access, you know. And so um, I like to do also, um, as an Indigenous person, I like to kind of acknowledge the land that I'm going to go travel on and fish on. So I kind of like to do a land acknowledgement, just kind of um, curious on, you know, what the ancestors that have cared for the lands before. And I use an app. Um, there's a native land app where you can kind of understand a little bit more historical context of um, whose lands was this originally? Um, so I live in the Ute um, ancestral lands, which is also known as the Roaring Fork Valley. So just a little bit of an extra layer that I like to kind of um, acknowledge mm. and think about before I go to the water. <laughs> You know, that's something I've never done. And that is a, a really nice touch that I'm going to add to my to my fishing trips every before I get in the water every time. I think that's that's really, really a great idea. Yeah, so, I've noticed a lot of you. folks, um, you know, kind of entering the fishing space of just, you know, uh, let's get to the water and start fishing and catch those big mm -hmm. fish. But I kind of like yeah. to add a little more reverence to it and um, yeah. Yeah, knowing where I'm exploring in the historical context of where we're at and um, just recognizing that and acknowledging that's important to me. I'm going to do that. I promise. <laughs> Thanks. Awesome. <laughs> well, there's the resource that was in the chat as well. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. I'm for that. There's an app and there's also phone numbers you can call or just a Google search as well. So, <laughs> great. I'm going to download that app. <laughs> so, let's talk about getting started. Yeah. You know, I get a lot of questions on what do I need to bring? And I know that there's several, I don't know, I like to kind of go light. I've just got a pack, um, you know, but it's kind of flinging all over the place. So I don't know how to stay organized. I don't know what to bring, what's essential. Do I need to bring all this tippet? Because <laughs> I've seen those spools of tippet, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, and kind of all these gadgets and whatnot. So just kind of basics, I think, is kind of where I started. Um, and eventually my my pile and stash has grown over the years. But um, yeah. just kind of going over, I know that we went over some essentials last last month, but um, just maybe like what kind of flies should you bring? Um, do you need a big box? Do you need anything? Um, yeah, what kind of significant things should I consider bringing? Yeah, well, you know, I have um, I have various setups depending on what I'm going to do. And I have a small stream setup that is a small pack. I could put everything in my pocket, really. Um, and it's one fly box and uh, four spools of tippet because I have 4X and 5X fluorocarbon and nylon because I don't know if I'm going to fish nymphs or dries. And uh, a pair of snips and forceps and fly floating. And that's all I carry in small streams. Thanks. Does your fly box have an assortment of flies or a certain type of flies? 
Yeah, it's, a, it's an assortment. You know, a few nymphs, uh, a bunch of big dries, and maybe one or two streamers. I hardly ever use streamers on small streams, but I, I, keep, I put a couple in there just in case. Yeah, awesome. Um, Great. That's kind of what I've been starting off with as well, I'm keeping it simple. <laughs> yeah. However, when I go to a bigger trout river, particularly one that I don't know very well, and I might encounter hatches or who knows what, you know, I might see a pike or a, a bass or a trout or a carp. Um, I have a heavy pack. I have a, a guide sling and, you know, I'm a fly tire. So I do, I do carry a lot more flies than most people do. Um, so, you know, there I'm going to carry, I limit myself to two dry fly boxes, two big ones mm -hmm. and three nymph boxes, um, big nymphs, medium sized nymphs, which would be, uh, 14s and 16s and then tiny nymphs, 18s and smaller mm -hmm. and, uh, and a box of streamers. Sometimes I'll leave the streamers out, but most time I'll keep the streamers with me. And then. Uh, you know, there I'll have probably eight spools of tippet. Um, I'll have, well, I'll show you actually. Because <laughs> I got my pack right here and getting ready for a trip. So I have, um, I have this uh, nice tippet dispenser that's on the front of my uh, sling bag. And if I'm going to be fishing mostly nymphs, I'll have, uh, my fluorocarbon out there. And if I'm going to be fishing mostly dries, then I'll pop that out and put my nylon on the outside. Mm -hmm. um, this is empty right now. All my fly boxes are laying on the floor. Um, <laughs> and then I, you know, I carry, I carry a, a, some strike indicators, um, but you know, you do, and I, you know, I carry, I carry way too much. And you don't need that much stuff. You I mean you need a box of flies. You need um, something to cut your line, whether it's a pair of scissors or um, your teeth, which you shouldn't do, but I do often. Yeah. And you need um, you need you need um, you should have forceps just to get the uh, to debarb your flies if you want to, and to get the hook out of the fish. And and then you know if you're gonna f fish dries at all, you need some kind of fly floating. Mm -hmm. it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, so my friend um, had questions of what's the difference between nymph fishing and fly fishing? <laughs> so, and, you know, as a beginner, that's kind of difficult to kind of distinguish. But I've been just saying dries are on the top of the water, on top of the surface, and nymphing is underneath the surface. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Nymphs and streamers are under the surface, but streamers yeah. aren't nymphs, which is confusing to people. Mm hmm. Streamers are a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, they're a lot of fun because it's active. So Absolutely. let's talk about, you know, when you first, when you first get to the water, uh, you're standing on the bank. There may be some people in the river. There may not be or in a lake. What do you do? What do you do first? I kind of like to just sit and chill for a minute. Um, you know, one thing that I've noticed that I've learned through my years is not to just go directly into the water because <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. there could be fish, yeah. you know, at the bank that you're standing on. Yeah. So approaching yeah. the water, you know, a little bit further back. And um, my personal thing is just to kind of sit and chill and see what's happening. Um, or is there anything floating around? You know, if there's bugs in the air, like today one landed on my leg. So I just kind of turned it over and saw what color it was, what it looked like. Um, you know, and that's the, ty the type of fly that I I tried to look for something similar. I don't know if it was exactly like it, but um, it looks similar. Um, and then I've also kind of turned over some rocks as well, just to kind of see what's underneath. Um, so yeah, that's kind of um, what I've been doing. <laughs> yeah, people worry so much about entomology and knowing all the insects and really, um, you just need to see what bugs are actually on the water. What's in the air is not always what's on the water. And you just need to, you just need to get into a backwater or a slow area where there's bugs close to the bank and pick one up and just look through your box and pick the closest thing. That's, you know, that's all you have to do. You don't even have to know if it's a mayfly or a caddis fly. You just, mm -hmm. you just pick a fly that looks close yeah. and you try that. And if it doesn't work, then you try something else. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I think that, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just, I saw a question by Roger Bird of how do you decide what flies to take other than your confidence flies? 
Is that for me or you? Uh, for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Roger, I carry everything. Um, I, I, I don't really, I, you know, I have confidence flies, but they're, you know, I, I, I'm not a good one to ask Erica. He should ask you because I carry everything because I'm I'm like the Boy Scout. Um, you know, I want to be prepared. Yeah, that's actually <laughs> one thing that I was like five years later of, of uh, fishing. Um, I I once I got started, I had a friend that also tied a lot of flies. And so, oh, this is actually really funny. I'm going to grab this. This is um, like. I, he just gave me a bunch of random flies. Wow, cool. So I've just been picking out, like, what, I don't know. I have no idea. These are no names. Um, and so that's kind of been my strategy so far. It's just like, oh, I'll just grab a handful and see what it works. And that's kind of how I got by the first couple of years. Um, you know, now I kind of just go to the fly shops and kind of ask questions of, you know, uh, I'm noticing a change in the seasons and whatnot and different bugs and stuff. So I just go to the shop and, you know, I have the regular flies, you know, um, pheasant tails, stimulators, you know, kind of more attractor type stuff. Um, and then if I want to start to get a little bit more knowledgeable about the local area and the, and the flows in the seasons, I just go to the fly shop and um, ask them <laughs> what they would recommend. Yeah, that's, the, I mean, even, even a guide who is on the river every day, they don't always know what fly or flies because there's in any given day, there's going to be 50 different flies that work. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not, it, there's never, there's never a time when there's one, only one fly that works and, and you have to experiment and that, that's part of the fun and, yeah. you know, and put on something that, that you think is really dumb someday. Yeah. Like, totally, totally uncalled for because it could be, it could be the fly of the day. You don't know. You, you never know. And that's, and that's why we love this, this sport or whatever you pastime, whatever you want to call it, because um, there are no answers. There yeah. are no, there are no good solid answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. That's how I've been kind of getting by and it's just trial and error. Let's just try this random fly. And, so, you know, I would actually say for the most part, it works. Of just yeah. Kind of <laughs> yeah. 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 Trouter, trouter, no, trout and, and most, most of the game fish we fish, all the game fish we fish for are not that smart. And mm -hmm. they want to eat. They have to eat. And, um, you know, if, if they don't take something, we might have scared them um, or it was just it was just way out of the bounds of what they're used to eating, mm -hmm. uh, either either too small for them to notice or too, or too big for them to get in their mouth yeah. uh, or too big for them to attack. But, you know, in the, for the most part, it, it's not it's not that difficult. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, um, mm -hmm. sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, there's another question, unless you, about rod and reel. Um, what rod and reel combo would you recommend? <laughs> well, if you're not going to tell me anything else, I would get a nine foot five weight. That's going to, that's going to do you, um, do you well for nearly, it's going to do you well for any trout stream in the world. Um, mm -hmm. you, there's no place you can't fish with a, a nine foot five weight. Um, there, yeah. there will be times when um, after you, get to do this for a while when you want something a little lighter or a little heavier or a little shorter or a little longer. But um, nine foot five weight rod is is the, the basic trout rod. Cool, great. I've had a lot of success with the Orvis encounter setup um, when mm -hmm. getting folks um, on the water uh, just because it's a kit, <laughs> it's fairly reasonably priced. Um, mm -hmm. and it, you know, I, I didn't know the difference between rod types, um, you know, until a few years later. So now I'm starting to kind of nerd out, but just getting mm -hmm. started, it was nice to just kind of get going with everything that you need in one kit. So, <laughs> yeah. And it's less than $200 for the whole, the whole outfit. So yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's a great way to get started. The encounter outfit. Um, yeah. Let's talk about, let's talk about reeling for a little bit. Uh, should I reel right or left-handed? And, um, you know, people, you know, you have to, when, when you buy an outfit and they, they put the line on for you, or they get it from Orvis or you get it at the fly shop, they're going to say, do you want it right or left hand? Mm -hmm. And that means, are you going to crank the reel 
with your right hand or are you going to crank the reel with your left hand? And there is no right or wrong way to do it. it and it, it doesn't even have anything to do with whether you're right or left-handed. Uh, a lot of people who spin fish are used to cranking with their opposite hand. So they cast right-handed and then they reel with their left hand. And that's the way most, most right-handers want it set up these days. And, and that's great. Um, I'm what they call old fashioned in that I cast right-handed, but I also reel right-handed. And so when I reel in or when I play a fish, I have to take the rod and put it in my other hand and reel. Um, it, it, it sounds, it sounds backwards and it sounds complicated and convoluted, but, um, you get used to it. And, you know, if, if I'm casting all day long, and then I hook a fish and I'm playing that fish. I like to give this, my right hand a rest and use my left hand to play the fish and then crank. And I'm so strongly right-handed that it's easier for me to really reel on that, on, on that thing with my right hand. But yeah. it doesn't matter, okay? Just pick up a fly rod, go into a store, pick up a fly rod and hold it in your casting hand and say, okay, which is more comfortable for me to reel with my right or left hand. Most people are going to pick their left hand, um, but it really, it really doesn't matter. Um, it really doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's a total personal choice. So um, just decide one way or the other and you'll get used to it. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Very cool. The I other thing. Gonna, it, yeah. Sorry, I was very confused with that. So I ended up just sitting, taking a moment cause I got so excited to just get going. And then I would always have to re-rig when I got to the water just because it wasn't comfortable for me. Um, and then anyway, so yeah, just kind of having that extra moment to kind of figure out what's more comfortable for me. That's really useful. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's just whatever whatever is most comfortable for you. That's all it is. <laughs> That's all it is. I'm taking my friend fly fishing for the first time. What cast should I start him with? And is there a particular technique, gym for dye, that you'd recommend we start with? Hmm. Erica, why don't you take that one? <laughs> um, what kind of, what cast should I start him with? That's something that I'm actually going to get professional help for. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to, to fly fishing guide school to kind of get better at coaching and training new folks. So I'd actually be curious to hear more on that um, kind of technique. But I would say um, dry or nymph, I think it just depends on the type of season. I've taught people in the middle of the winter. So, you know, it was a nymph setup. Um, and actually, she's here visiting me this week. And today we did um, a dry dropper because just the weather has changed. And um, so we were able to catch on both a dry and a dropper today. So that's been exciting. So um, or just kind of single fly as well because I know sometimes that can get kind of tangled and whatnot. But um, yeah, definitely kind of starting on the land first can be really helpful before putting on a fly. <laughs> so um, I have kind of um, uh, chopped off hooks before and just kind of tied on the dry fly to kind of start with target practice and kind of work on their form. So that's something that I've tried. What about you, Tom? Yeah, first of all, uh, Jason, I wouldn't take your friend fly fishing. I wouldn't try to teach someone casting on the river particularly if, you know, there's fish feeding and the fishing is good. Um, anybody that goes fishing needs to practice on dry land away from fish first um, uh, because there's too many distractions uh, once you get on the river. So they need to develop that muscle memory and be comfortable with the cast. Um, that being said, um, if, if the water isn't too high and dirty, um, I personally, I find that swinging a wet fly is um, one of the easiest ways uh, if the fish are cooperated, cooperating to get people started because you can make a just a roll cast you know, and teach them how to make a, a simple roll cast, get the fly out there, and then just tell them to follow the line with the rod tip and just let the current do all the work for you, swing it downstream, then pick it up and put it back there. The other thing about fishing a wet fly is um, novices often have trouble with the strike. They don't strike quickly enough because they haven't developed that reflex. And um, with a wet fly swung downstream, you generally don't want to set the hook. Uh, you just want to let the fish hook itself. 
And so that kind of eliminates that problem. And you could even put a small streamer on um, mm -hmm. and, and swing that like a small woolly bugger, or a little muddler minnow or something that's not too big and heavy. But um, just getting them, they don't have to, you know, swinging a fly, you don't have to worry as much about variant currents and mending line and, and all the other stuff. Uh, get them in a piece of uniform water, a riffle or just kind of uh, water that's moving at the same speed, whether it's a pool or a riffle. And just get them to throw it across from them or a little bit downstream and let it swing in the current. Sometimes a fish will actually take the fly when it's just hanging down below you. So that's the way, you know, if the fish are cooperative, that's the way I'll usually get someone started. Because I think it, um, it gets people into fish quickly and um, doesn't, uh, doesn't create too many complexities. Yeah, that's great. I like that advice. When fishing a particular lane or pool, how long do you spend there before moving? Will you judge your depth, fly pattern, or anything else before moving on? Uh, great question. Mm -hmm. Erica? Yeah, so I've noticed that um, I, my my dad in particular, he likes to spend all day in one spot, <laughs> and I like to move around. Um, I typically have started a little bit of a pattern, so when I get to the water, I'll start inside the closest to me, and then I'll start to cast out eventually and wade out of the water if it's um, good flows, um, until I kind of just, you know, hit that entire section, then I move up to the next um, area and kind of have a little pattern routine there, so that's kind of what's been working for me um, to be able to kind of uh, move around, um, explore new waters and kind of just, I feel like once I hit that spot already, I might have spooked the fish or, um, you know, just kind of time to move on sometimes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, and Larry, it really depends, uh, also depends on how confident you are there are fish in front of you. Um, you know, if I'm on a very productive river like the Madison or the Missouri or the Bighorn, whatever, um, I know that there's fish in front of me and I'll stay for a while. I'll, I'll adjust again, <laughs> adjust your depth, your fly pattern, your technique, how you're presenting the fly, the angles you cast at, whatever, um, before I'll move on. Um, but a river like my, my home river, the Batten kill doesn't have a lot of fish in it. And so I don't, sometimes I don't know if there's any fish in the pool. So I lose confidence, you know, I'll, I'll fish it as well as I can. And if I don't get something in a few dozen casts, I'll, I'll move a little bit. I might move, I might only move 10 feet, but I'll move a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it, it, a lot of it depends on how many fish are in the river, how dense the population is and how confident you are that there's, that there's a fish in front of you. Yeah, that's great. Cool. And if there's a fish rising, I'll work them all day without leaving. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Is fly fishing some as original fishing? I don't know, Zay, if there is an original fishing. Um, probably bait fishing is the original fishing, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I just think yeah. kind of back to sustenance probably <laughs> you yeah. know what did that look like um and yeah. then it evolved into what we do now catch and release or whatnot <laughs> we're finding we're finding more and more historical evidence that fly fishing is older than we thought though you know the, the oh, greeks right. the greeks and the romans and medieval times um they did actually fish with flies the, the tackle was different but um they mm -hmm. did actually fish with artificial flies back quite a ways longer than we originally thought so it is an old it is yeah. an old, old technique. Yeah. I'm curious on this question from Donald um, for you to answer, Tom. <laughs> I'm also. Yeah. Um, Donald, uh, that's, that's going to be a matter of opinion. Um, you'll, you'll get all kinds of opinions on that question. Uh, my personal preference is to start someone on a slower rod because they can feel the rod bend and they can feel that point at which the rod is loaded and then they can stop and then make the, the forward cast. So, um, you know, I, I, think, I think a bamboo or a fiberglass rod is a, is a good way to learn um, or, or a slower action graphite rod. Sometimes we'll actually, when we're teaching people, we will actually overline 
a rod. So if it's a nine foot five weight, we might put a six weight or even a seven weight line on that rod um, because it'll make the rod bend more. There's more mass pulling on that rod uh, a little bit more. And it'll, it'll sometimes help people uh, get the casting motion. Whereas if you, if you put a really stiff fax, fast action rod in a beginner's hands, um, it feels like a broomstick to them. They can't make it bend. So yeah. I would, I would, I, I would urge you not to get her a fast action rod to learn. That would be, that would be, that's my opinion only, but I would try a slower action rod. Fiberglass is a, a good rod to start on. Hmm. Cool. Thanks for that. I'm, I was curious myself. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's, but again, that's my opinion. There are some people that believe that you should start a beginner. And it kind of depends on somebody's personality, too. A, you know, a type A personality that's that's really going to uh, beat a rod really hard, try to force it. Sometimes they're better with a fast action rod. But most people, uh, and if you're a more laid back, relaxed person, you're probably better with a slow action rod. But um I think you know, that's it, actually, yeah, that's actually interesting to kind of look at that because I have been confused on um, teaching people with fast or slow and I've been using slow, but I didn't realize that my friend that was here earlier, she's been using fast action, but she's really aggressive. So she likes mm -hmm, to be really, mm -hmm. she's very deliberate. Uh, yeah. So she was having a really hard time with that slow because she was just like, that's just too much. I don't like this bend. I don't like it. So uh, we set her up with a, a fast action rod instead and she's been doing really well. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a personal thing. It's like buying a car, you know, people, different, different cars have different personalities and people pick them for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. cool. Should we talk about uh, putting leaders on lines? Should we talk about that? Yes. What are some, I know that knots can be a little intimidating, um, but I just learned one and I, it's been helpful or two, I guess, one to tie a tip it on. And then, or let me just back up actually. How do you actually put leader on? <laughs> And then I mean, um, how do you tie on your fly? So I think those are the yeah. two ones that can just get anyone started. So. Okay. Shall we demonstrate? Yeah. Okay. I've got, a, I've got um, something set up here. If Julia can give me full screen or, or minimum, yeah. uh, put Erica. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> that's perfect. Okay. So um, I've got, a, I've got a, a fly line here that has a loop on the end. And nearly all of them come with a permanent loop. Uh, on the end of the line. So that's your line. That's the heavy stuff. That's what you cast and it's opaque. You need a leader on the end of there um, to keep that heavy opaque stuff away from the fish. So take the leader out of the package. Now here is a, is, here's a hot tip for you. Most people will grab the fine end of that leader and try to unwind it. And what happens is um, the leader ends up in a big mess, a, a big knot. So here's the way to unwind the leader. Because, because these leaders are always put on, um, well, I, I'll actually show you how they're putting on, but let me show you how to, how to take this leader apart without tangles. So you see the butt, the butt end, that's the heavy end, and it's got a loop on it. You see the loop right there? Mm -hmm. And that's been wound around uh, these coils. So what you're gonna do is push that through and I'm not even going to worry about that little uh, piece of the end of the leader sticking out. And you're going to see that it's wrapped around that leader probably four, five, six times, depending on the person who, who wound this. And then all of a sudden you'll see, okay, now it's not, it's not wound around that leader anymore. So you put that leader in your hand like this, and you just peel it off your hand like that, and that will keep all of the leader from, and I got that little that little end sticking out, but that's okay. And I'll just keep going to the end. And there we go. I've taken, I've got my whole leader off there and it's all uh, nice and organized and there's no knots in it. This is a, obviously a knotless leader. And then, and then the leader has memory, okay, because it's been coiled up. Leader has memory. So to get the coils out of that leader, <coughs> you don't need a special leader straightener or anything. All you do is grab that leader, 
with your with your hands and pull it pull it pull it and go all the way down start at the top and go all the way down the length of the leader just pulling on it it'll stretch a little bit and you can see now those coils are nearly gone it'll mm -hmm. never it'll never be completely straight as a ruler um, and you go all the way to the end and now my leader is going to be nice and straight it's not going to coil so all you do is pull it you don't need to you don't want to run it through an inner tube or some special device that you see uh, that's all you need to do and it's always going to have a little bit of curl at the end but that's fine mm -hmm. so that's that's how you take a leader out of a package now if you want to put one away let's put let's put this leader away you take the uh, fine end and you pinch it with your thumb and you just wind that leader around your hand until you get almost to the end, the heavy end. And then you just take it off your hand and you just wind this around the rest of the leader three, four, five times. And now that leader will stay put in your leader wallet or wherever you carry it. So, um, cool. I didn't know you could reuse leader or retie. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. You know, sometimes you, you want to switch to a shorter or a longer leader or something. You can reuse and put them back. So I'm going to unwind this. Now I'm going to put it on my fly line. All right. So I got my leader. I got it straightened and I'll keep pulling it because there's always some kinks left in it. So here's my fly line. I got a loop on my fly line and I got a loop on the leader. Here's how you do it. You place the fly line up through the center. Can you move it down? Oh. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. You place your fly line up through the center of your leader. So the leader loop goes over the line loop like so. And then you just take your leader. You don't have to go all the way back to the end. Just take your leader and double it over and push it through that loop and then pull it all the way through. This is a long leader. <laughs> My arm's not long enough. It's a 12 footer. And then you've got these two loops that are interlocked and you just pull them together. Sometimes you have to push the knot through there. And now you've got a, knot, a knotless connection. You don't have to tie any knots and mm -hmm. It's a nice, it's a nice slim connection. If you don't have a permanent loop on your fly line, then you have to tie what's called a nail knot. And it's not an easy knot and we're not going to tie it today. <laughs> um, so that's, that's how you put your leader on. Nice. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Tom. I noticed that one of my first reels or lines that I had didn't have the loop on the end. So I just yeah. took it to a fly shop and they did the nail knot for me. So mm -hmm. <laughs> they were really helpful. <laughs> yeah, the nail knot is, um, I mean, you, you can, uh, it, it's on the Orvis Learning Center if you want to learn how to do it. If you don't have a loop on the end of your fly line, you want to put a nail knot on there, um, you can learn how to do it. You um, don't try to do it with a nail. That's very difficult. Find yourself, um, a small hollow tube, like an old uh, ballpoint pen or a stir stick, uh, plastic stir stick or a very small diameter straw that makes a tube, some kind of little tube or an inflator from a football. Um, that, that works really well to tie, tie a nail knot, but tie with a tube. Some, in fact, some people call it the tube knot. Um, you can do it with a nail, but it's a lot more difficult with a nail. It's a lot easier with, with some sort of tube. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we had an interesting tip, and I'm curious to see if you've used it, Tom or Erica. Someone said that um, if they have a new leader they put and it's, they're at home, they put it in hot water for a moment, and it removes the memory. Have you tried that, you tried that before? Yeah, I used to when I was a kid. <laughs> Um, yeah, but I'm I'm not so sure that uh, you know if you get the water too hot, 
I'm not so sure that it's not going to affect the, the nylon, the integrity of the nylon. Um, just pull on it. It'll take nearly all the kinks out of it. Just pull on it. It's not that hard. You don't need to make this overly complicated. Just stretch it in your hands and it'll, it'll straighten out. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> Would a perfection loop be good to show? Um, I don't. I think that if someone wants to learn some of these um, knots, I think that a better place to do it is on the Orvis Learning Center. The perfection loops on there, and there's both videos and animations. And um, I think that I think that that's a better interface than doing it live here. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I don't. I don't want people to try to tie along with me. That's something that you want to wait for a quiet time at home and, and practice it. Yeah. Yeah. I think after a few years of fishing, I finally figured it out. Um, but if you're just kind of looking to get a newbie on the water and kind of focusing on how to get set up, um, I would love to kind of see how to tie a fly on as well. How do you tie that? Mm -hmm. on? Well, I, I use a pretty standard, um, I use a, I use a pretty standard uh, clinch knot. But you know, I saw a question about uh, tippet rings, and that's a yeah. that's a really good um, that's a that's a really good question. So, if you use a tippet ring, a tippet ring, um, and I'll show you one close up. But a tippet ring is just a little. Uh, um, it, it's on a snap swivel, but the tippet rings are the little things that are on that snap swivel, and it's just a little metal, a little piece of metal. It's a little metal ring. Um, let's let's go to the close-up camera. <clears throat> so this leader that I have starts thick, and then it tapers down and gets thick gradually. It's a knotless tapered leader, so it gets thinner and thinner and thinner as you get toward the end. And a leader will come with a long long enough tippet, long enough level tippet, the way they're made. Uh, to fish with. It's usually a couple feet long. And this will be, this is a 5X leader. So this will be 5X, you know, up to, up to about, uh, you know, uh, two feet back on the leader. But as you, um, as you tie a fly on, every time you tie a fly on, you lose a little bit of material, right? And you get further down and the leader gets heavier. And sometimes it gets too thick um, to get through the eye of the fly or to fool a fish. So what you have to do when that leader gets too thick is you have to take a spool of tippet material. This is 4X, um, and you have, to, you have to tie a piece on. And um, there's another way of doing it with one of these tippet rings, which makes it easier because you don't have to keep tying knots. So I'm going to take this tippet ring these tippet rings out of the package and it's a snap swivel and you can see these little rings on the end here mm -hmm. and so all you need to do first of all you need to find out which way this thing's going to open which is this way okay so keep it on keep the tip don't take the tippet ring out before you tie it on because otherwise you're going to lose it like I, I have done many times. Keeping it, keeping it on the uh, snap swivel, you're going to, I can do this so far away, you're going to just run your tippet through the tippet ring, and you're going to tie a clinch knot. Now, the clinch knot is five times around the standing part of the line, and then you go back through the loop. And when I tie a clinch knot, I like to keep my my finger, my forefinger and thumb in front of the fly or the tippet ring, so that um, so that I keep that loop open. And then you just figure out you figure out how to go around five times. Your your fingers will figure it out. It takes some muscle memory. This is the way I do it. So I went once, twice three times, four times, five times. I like six turns on a clinch knot. They say five will hold. However, I don't count that well. 
And I figure <laughs> if I do six, I know that I've got at least five. And then you've been holding that loop in front of that tippet ring open. You just pass that back through the loop, pass the tag end, and then hold the tag end. And you want to tighten a knot not by pulling on the, never pull on the tag end. You can see the little tag end there. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to pull on the tag end. You want to pull in the direction that force is going to be applied when you hook a fish or when you hook the bottom. And um, you always want to wet your knots. I'm going to put this in my mouth for a second and wet it. And then you just tighten your knot with a fairly quick, firm pull like that. And then always test your knots because mm -hmm. sometimes, sometimes you've missed that hole when you came back through. And I can't tell you the number of times I've made a cast and the fly comes right off and I know that I tied a clinch knot, but I didn't test it. <laughs> um, and, and, and that's, I just used a standard clinch knot five, five, six times around and back through the loop. And that's, that's all I do. Now mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to cut this with my teeth. Don't tell my dentist. <laughs> so I've cut that tag end. Now <laughs> I can open, I can open up the snap swivel and just pull the tippet ring off. Close it back up so you don't lose them Then stick it back in your, in your fishing bag or wherever, hang it from your vest. And now if I want to uh, tie a new piece of tippet material on, I don't have to do a blood knot or I don't have to do um, a surgeon's knot or anything. Anytime mm -hmm. I need a new piece of tippet, I just tie another clinch knot on the end of that, on the end of that tippet ring. Whoa, I've never seen that before. Oh, <laughs> My you have it right now. <laughs> yeah, so it's just two clinch knots, right? <laughs> and the other thing is that, um, you know, some people use uh, nylon leaders and mm -hmm. they use a fluorocarbon tippet, like when you're fishing nymphs. And sometimes nylon and fluorocarbon uh, don't play well together, they don't mm -hmm. knot well together. Um, and this eliminates that issue because you're just tying two clinch knots. Yeah. So I'm going to tie another clinch knot here. Nice. I've been struggling real hard with that blood knot. So this is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, triple surgeon's knot is, is much easier than a blood knot. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tighten that. I won't, I won't wet this one. Test it. Ah, see? <laughs> It broke. That yep. is why you test your knots. <laughs> so I don't know why that broke, um, but that's why you test your knots. Yeah, that's great. So I'm gonna I'm gonna retie I'm gonna retie that leader. It broke at the leader end. Hmm. I'm gonna retie that leader <laughs> back on there. Yeah, Jason, <laughs> life changing. It really is. My mind is blown right now. <laughs> yeah, people like tippet rings. I lost the end of my. I lost the end of my uh, leader. I got to find it. It's under the table somewhere. <laughs> you can hear me biting that tippet, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I won't tell your dentist, believe me. <laughs> I doubt if she watches this. I think I'm safe. <laughs> I do use snips. Um, I just didn't have a pair right here. So <laughs> now I'm going to, I can find the end of my leader. And I always have to have the fly in my left hand. That's just, <laughs> I can only tie it one way. And you know, knots are hard. I was, I was uh, teaching myself a new knot that I had never uh, used before. And God, it took me a couple days. I was frustrated as, as all hell. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I can tie it. I can tie a clinch knot with my eyes closed, but um, literally, but um, you know, when you learn a new knot, it's tough. You have to develop that muscle memory. Mm-hmm. 
see that didn't let's see if that tightened okay now it's tight so always test these connections because it, it's weird um a knot can look perfect but it it, it won't hold and um and you know we we do not knot tests with people and any even a good knot tire mm -hmm. um when they uh when they tie a dozen knots or 10 knots and we test them on an instrument machine there'll be 30 to 40 percent variation in the brake strength of a good knot tires knots mm -hmm. um for whatever reason i don't know but you always test them so there's the there's the tippet ring and now um when this tippet gets too short I don't have to cut back my leader. All I have to do is come in here and tie a new piece of tippet on there. Mm, yeah. So they're very handy. Uh, they're very handy to use, um, and uh, they work quite well. The one thing I want to I want to warn people about because I've heard about this before. Um, I get people uh, podcast questions, and people mm -hmm. say, "I got some tippet rings." And my tippet keeps breaking. My tippet keeps breaking on the tippet ring. And I say, where'd you get those tippet rings? Oh, I got them on Amazon. I got a real bargain. Um, the tippet rings that you buy in a fly shop or from Orvis are really well polished. If you want to save yourself some money and get tippet rings from Amazon, go right ahead. You're going to lose fish and you're going to lose flies because they don't polish them well enough and they have burrs on them. And uh, they eventually abrade the tippet and it breaks. So mm. don't. This is not a place to save money, guys. Yeah. Uh, don't get cheap tippet rings. Get good ones. They come in three sizes. They come in small, medium, and large. A small is really small. Um, some people even use them with dry flies. Mm -hmm. uh, the the tiny ones are. The tiny ones are are really light, and you could use it with a dry fly, but it's it's almost as hard to to uh to tie uh the tippet to a the tiny tippet ring as it is to tie on a tiny fly so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just i usually use i usually use them with nymphs and i use the bigger one nymphs or streamers yeah um, but does they that, but they tippet rings are very handy does the tippet ring um affect the drift at all on a dry fly i don't think so you know as long as your tippet's long enough a little bit of your leader's going to sink here and there anyways yeah. And, um, you know, they're so small, mm -hmm. uh, there's very little weight. Mm -hmm. I don't use them on dry flies, but yeah. um, you could, you, you could certainly, people do, people do use them with dry flies. Yeah. So cool. that's the tippet ring. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. I've been trying to figure out how to connect different. Yeah. That's just, yeah. A great, great tool. Thanks, Dom. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mike says, would a double pass of the line through the tippet ring give extra strength to the knot? Yes, Mike. Actually, it would. Um, that's called a trilene knot. Um, and that's a knot I'll use a lot for streamers and saltwater flies. And um, I can show you that knot, actually, because it's a really good, that's a really, really strong knot, particularly if you've got um, a fairly fine tippet and uh and a bigger diameter either fly or tippet ring if there's a big difference between the wire diameter and the tippet diameter um, that knot will not always hold because there's too too acute of an angle between the end of the knot and and the wire so um, in that case I'll, I'll use a trilene knot and it's very similar to the clinch knot but i'll, I'll show you that mm -hmm. knot yeah because it's a really good one so i'm going to take this uh i'm going to take the other reason i like a clinch knot is when you want to take it off something, you can just take your fingernails and pull on those barrels and it will come right off. <laughs> I'm just la I'm just lazy, Erica. I'm just <laughs> Smarter, lazy. not harder. <laughs> yeah. And that actually saves microplastics too if, if you're tipping away all the time. Right, yeah. Okay, so here's how to tie the trilene knot. So you go through the eye, and this could be a fly or a tippet ring, right? You go through the eye. Can you move a little bit more down, Tom? Yeah, yeah. sorry. You go So you go through the eye, and then you come around again mm -hmm. from the same direction, and you go through it again. And you carefully pinch it there. So now what you've got, once you start tying that, is you're going to have a double loop in front 
of the eye because once you start going around there you've formed a second loop mm -hmm. and now it's a little trickier to tighten but you got to go through you got to go through both loops and i let go of it so i kind of lost my You know what? Let's tie that with fly line or something <laughs> bigger, uh, just so people could see it a little yeah, bit easier. I'm going to tie it with, uh, let's see, what should I tie it with? <laughs> I'll tie it with some, some heavy fly tying thread. How's that? <laughs> I'll get some fly tying thread here. This will, I hope will make it easier to, to, no, that's no good. That's not the right kind of fly tying thread. I don't want that. Let me find some red thread here in my fly tying stuff. Nice. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Okay. This will work better. So let's pretend this is our tippet. Can you see that okay? Uh, yes. Okay. So. You go through the you know, wet the end of this thread. I don't know what I would do without saliva because um, <laughs> it's frayed. So you're going to go through the eye. And then you're going to come back and go through again. Same way. Thread wasn't such a good idea either. <laughs> it's too limp. Ah. Yeah, that's going to give me problems. Ah, that's going to give me problems. <laughs> oh, no. All right. Uh, <laughs> I have some heavy I have some heavy monofilament. Let's try that. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. I'm really yeah. It's, I'm curious about this as well. <laughs> okay. Because it is a really good knot. And I'm glad that I'm glad that somebody. All right. So I got heavy monofilament here. So I'm gonna go okay. through through the eye. And then I'm gonna just come around and go through again. Mm-hmm. And you can see, as I start to tie that knot, I I'm going to form a double loop in front of the eye. I'm just, mm -hmm. just going to go three times here, but you would, you would go five or six. And now when I come back, I've got a double loop in front of there. Just pass this through and finish it the same way you would an ordinary clinch knot. And tighten it. And then you've got a trilene knot. So... You've gone through the eye. You've just gone through the eye twice before you start the. Mm -hmm. Before you start it, so um, that is uh, that is a really good knot, and I'm glad somebody brought that up. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Can you speak briefly about where to add weights? When to use them? How hard do you pinch them down? As I've noticed, I can diminish the strength of the tippet. That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. Erica, want to handle that one? Oh, you're comfortable with that one? <laughs> I, I'm, not, you know, I would actually be curious. But the thing that I've kind of learned is um, looking at the depth of the water. Um, if there's no fish rising and whatnot, they're probably down below pretty deep. And so I try to gauge how deep it is. Um, and um, typically, I do like maybe a couple inches above, maybe two to three inches above the fly. Um, that's kind of what I've been doing. And I've tried different types of weights, the kind that just cinches, pinches down. I've also tried like this putty type stuff as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've been, I've been playing around with different weights. I, I typically um, haven't really nymphed well before. And so mm -hmm. that's a technique and skill that I'm always looking to improve on. So yeah, mm -hmm. if you have any standards that you use, Tom, I'd be curious. Well, Mike, um, remember this. Weights on the leader are a pain in the butt. <laughs> Um, yes, they are. <laughs> if you can get a, if you can get away with not putting weight on your leader, don't do it. Mm -hmm. um, 
if you can get the if you can get the depth, if you can get the fly to sink deep enough uh, by virtue of the fly's own weight. So a big heavy bead head, you know, mm -hmm. something with two beads on it, um, or or using two flies that have a lot of weight. Um, if you can get down deep enough using no weight on the leader, you're better off. Casting is going to be better. Um, adding uh, weight adds another uh, another thing that that can uh, have a centrifugal force around a, a tree when you hook it and um, will cause your tangles to be even worse. Um, so try to avoid it. And the way you know you're fishing deep enough generally is um, I assume you're fishing with it either, well, whether you're fishing with an indicator or you're, you're Euro nymphing, tight lining, um, you want to be ticking the bottom every five, six, seven casts. So you want to cast out there and, you know, every once in a while you see that, that line hesitate and, or the indicator hesitate. That's either you, you, you bumped over the top of a rock or, um, or it's a fish or, mm -hmm. um, or you may lose flies occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, if you're losing flies occasionally and you're ticking bottom occasionally, you're probably getting your fly deep enough. If you're not, what I would do is first try to, um, Get your get your indicator or uh, get your indicator or your euro nymphing um, everything in the same current lane, um, so that so that uh, the current isn't pulling the indicator or your or your uh, tight line rig off to the side. And um, the other thing you can do is move your indicator up higher on your leader to get deeper and angle more upstream to get deeper. The more you angle your cast upstream, the deeper it's going to sink on the drift. Because a, 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 an indicator is always going to move faster than the flies because the current at the surface is always faster than the current down below. Mm -hmm. um, so try everything you can to avoid putting weight on the leader. If <laughs> you still can't feel like you're not getting deep enough, maybe the water's really fast and deep, um, I usually start with uh, one small shot, and I generally put it six inches above mm -hmm. above my fly. Um, start with a small one, make a few casts, make a dozen, half dozen casts, and see if uh, you start ticking bottom. If you don't, then you might even raise your indicator up on the leader a little bit and Try a different angle. If that doesn't work, then add another small shot. It's much easier to add a shot than to take them off because they're a pain to take off. And um, yeah. I, I know some people that grow their thumbnails long uh, <laughs> because it's the only way to get a split shot off is to, you know, stick something in there and wedge it in there and open it up. But it's not easy. And they do damage. They do damage your, uh, your uh, tippet a little bit. So try to avoid it if you can. Or mm -hmm. try that putty. Uh, the sink sink putty, which is a tungsten powder with an adhesive, you know, it doesn't always stay on the leader very well, and it slides. So sometimes you need a knot to hold it in place. Mm -hmm. But um, um, it, it does work well, particularly if you're just kind of water loading and lobbing uh, the line out there. That putty works really well, and it's very easy to add a little bit or take a little bit off. Um, I, I like it a lot. I use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Preference for indicator. I've I've tried several things. Um, I've tried the strike indicator. I've tried you know just the basic stuff. But I I'm a fan of the airlocks because uh, kind of like what you were talking about. You can move it around if you're not getting that depth that you yeah. need. So um, it's a lot yeah. easier. <laughs> I've found. If you're going to use a plastic indicator, as far as I'm concerned, airlocks the only way to go. And the new foam ones uh, are just awesome. Uh, I think they're just they're just amazing. You know, the old ones were plastic, and occasionally they'd crack and then sink. Uh, the yes. new ones are foam, and they're they're just great. Yeah, they're great. They're easy. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm a big fan of yarn at times, and mm -hmm. I'll use either the New Zealand um, mm -hmm. indicator method, or I'll use what's called a, a Dorsey a Dorsey indicator, which you make yourself with. Um, uh, little rubber bands that they sell for uh, braces or the Donis mm. braces and a little bit of uh, macrame yarn, which is polypropylene. 
Um, if you, you can do a Google search on um, making a uh, Dorsey indicator. I think um, Dom at, um, oh, what's the name of that blog? Uh, I can't remember the name of his blog in Pennsylvania. Uh, anyway, uh, look up look up uh, Dorsey indicator. And if you want to do a, a DIY thing, get yourself some macrame yarn in different colors and some of those orthodontists uh, bands. You can get them. You can get those from Amazon. You're okay there. <laughs> Just don't get tippet rings from Amazon. Um, so uh, th those are great indicators. And you can uh, be those and the New Zealand indicators, uh, which is yarn, you can modify them and make them as big or as small as you want. And what you can use, make whatever color, you can do multicolor ones. Um, mm -hmm. Yarn is uh, cast a little bit nicer. It lands a little bit softer. So it's, it tends not to spook fish as much and it's very sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do like yarn. I've never heard of anyone using yarn before. Do you just have like a little strip and you tie it around? Like how do you, how do you fish that? Um, you you put a you put a loop in your line, and that's where the orthodontist rubber oh, band it. comes in. Got it. And okay. then you you slip a bunch of yarn through uh, through the loop, and then you snug snug the uh, little rubber band up against the loop, and it holds it in place, and it gives you these two little ears that stick up. You also okay. yeah you also need a comb. You need a comb to kind of fuzz out the yarn so it floats better. <laughs> It's, it's kind of a pain, but it works really well. <laughs> that sounds horrible, Tom. I'm sick no, it's not that box. bad. It's not that bad. <laughs> and I've actually, actually on the, the Orvis Learning Center in the, um, in the indicator nymphing uh, uh, section uh, from the intermediate and advanced, I do show how to make a Dorsey indicator and how to use the New Zealand strike indicator yarn. So you can go in and take a look at that. Awesome. Great. If all else fails, use an airlock though. It's quick, easy, and they'll float forever. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yeah. They're great. They're <laughs> terrific. Yeah. Cool. What other questions do we have here? <laughs> I have a question a little bit about um, fishing etiquette. So, yeah, you know, let's new, talk about that. Like new fly fishing, like how do you know, you know, when you get to the water and there might be other people there, um, yeah. what, what's kind of like a nice standard practice to, that you go by, Tom? Well, I think that <clears throat> I hear a lot about these new people coming in the sport don't have any etiquette and they don't know, they don't know how much space to give people. And I, I think that's, I think that's crap. I think that's an excuse. It's common sense that you don't get in the water next to, you know, within a long cast of someone else. It's just, you don't need to learn that. And you don't need a mentor <laughs> to teach you that you just stay out of other people's way. It's just personal space. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I, so, um, but that being said, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Maybe people don't know. I don't think it's. A, I don't think it's education. I think it's just some people are jerks, honestly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and honestly, the people that I see that get in close to other people are generally more experienced anglers, older guys yes. who want to fish in that pool because that's where they always fish, and they're going to go fish that pool regardless of who's in there, mm -hmm. and. I don't see young people and new people crowding me on the river. I mm, don't see mm -hmm. that happening. And I've never had a woman crowd me on the river. Yeah. It's almost always old guys. So I'll, I'll get off my soapbox. And... <laughs> I had a friend that just took a kid's spot and was like, I just pulled the old man card. And I was like, he should probably give some space. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I've seen that as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. And people do it to kids too, which really, yeah, it really frosts me. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, a kid's concentrating on on fishing, and then some guy. Oh, it's just a kid. I'll get in next to him because I want to fish there. Ugh. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. No, I like this Jeff um, comment. Um, it's okay to ask someone whether they are working up or down the stream. I think communication is lacking mm -hmm. sometimes and there's just such yeah. secrecy already when we go there or we're trying to beat each other to the hole or whatnot. And so just basic communication and help saying hello and having some respect for someone, that's that's what I've generally found um, is really helpful <laughs> of communicating your plan of of just kind of connecting with other anglers on the water. So thanks, Jeff, for adding that. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Erica, did you ha did when you were starting, did you have to learn not to crowd someone on the river? Was that something you had to learn? I guess it's kind of this like fear that like I'm doing it wrong. And I don't know, I'm, I since I am self-taught, I didn't know etiquette. I, I You're right that it is basic knowledge to not get in somebody's cast, but it just kind of seemed very... Um, interpersonally unfriendly. So just kind of chat. I've learned how to be comfortable talking to other people, but yet not disturbing them. So mm -hmm. just, is it okay if I go upstream or is it okay if I move downstream? Yeah. Um, yeah. So kind of basic communication, but I think there was like a fear, especially, you know, social media forums or blogs and whatnot, and you hear people complaining and stuff. So it just kind of always lingered if I'm doing it right or if I'm not. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, we're we're seldom we're seldom limited to a small stretch of river. We're lucky in this country where we don't get assigned beats on a river. Um, you know, we we go and and fish where we want. And most of the time, most of the rivers that we all fish, there are miles and miles and miles of water if you're willing to walk. Yeah. And you know, if someone's disabled, uh, they should mm -hmm. be able to fish right near the the parking area. But if yeah. you're not, mm -hmm. if you're a, if, you know, if you're a, re, an adult that's in reasonable shape, don't fish near other people. There's a mm -hmm. number of reasons. One is you're going to piss them off. Um, the other reason is that they've already spooked a lot of those fish in the pool. And why do you want to fish fish that have been thrashed over? Go take a walk. Find mm -hmm. some undisturbed fish. They're going to be easier to catch. And you might have to explore a different kind of water than you're used to and you might discover some really cool stuff and you might discover your new favorite fishing spot i have discovered a lot of my favorite spots on mm -hmm. crowded rivers because i don't like seeing other people yeah exactly and um and, and i'll walk and i'll and i'll find some i'll find some really great spots just by exploring mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that you kind of consider disabled folks because I went to um, <clears throat> it has fishing docks um, and I noticed a lot of able folks um, or physically able folks there and my friend in a wheelchair um, had to go home um, because uh, there was the, uh, a place for them to fish. So that's horrible. That's something to consider. So thanks for kind of adding that. If you're in reasonably shape, <laughs> maybe leave the docks for folks that might need it. <laughs> yeah. And if you, you know, if, if you're in reasonable shape and you see somebody coming down the water, maybe it's just an old person that has a waiting staff and they can't wait very well, then, then get out of the way and let them have the water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Great, thanks for adding that. Cool. So how do you know to call it a day, Tom? Is it just kind of how much time you have? Or I, I see a question of um, also, how much time do you give it a rest? Um, uh, would you give, well, I can't read right now. <laughs> how much time would you give it to rest a pool before entering again um, or following another angler? Yeah. Um. Rule of thumb, at least a half an hour. Mm -hmm. And I would say um, it depends on depends on the river. Some rivers fish come right back after being spooked. Um, rivers with a lot of food, like the Bighorn, Missouri, um, you know, really the, the Roaring Fork where, where you are, mm -hmm. fish don't, they seem to get back on the feed really quickly. Whereas in a, a less fertile stream where there's not as much food, Fish can be spooked for hours and, and not, not come back and feed. So mm -hmm. it, it really depends. I would give it, I would give a pool at least an hour, mm -hmm. half hour to an hour. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thanks. And when do I know, when do I know when to call it quits? Yeah. When it gets, <laughs> when it gets too dark to see. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe I'll maybe I'll continue on and go night fishing. 
Yeah, there was a full moon a few weeks ago, and I stayed out till the sun went down. And I, w- I wish I had some better equipment for night fishing. <laughs> well, you know, night fishing, you re- you really need, you should never night fish alone. Mm-hmm. And um, you should always know the water. You should explore it during the day so you know where the logs and drop-offs are. Um, you know, never go to unfamiliar water at night. You, you need to do a, a recon um, before you before you night fish. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And don't ever do it alone because um, that can that can be you know if you slip and fall in there's nobody not going to be anybody around to pull you out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Well, <laughs> what else we got, Tom? <laughs> I see people talking about jet skis, but you know my, my belief is that. Um, when they put somebody on a jet ski, they remove most of their brain and lobotic, lobotomize them. Um, uh, you know, you, <laughs> we're not, we're, we're not going to eliminate those jerks. <laughs> and and there's nothing you can do about it mm-hmm. to go somewhere else, go where they can't go, something. Yeah. Cool. Great. Um, another thing, you know, another safety thing that, <clears throat> that, that we stress, but, but you know, there's, there's a lot of people here that, um, that are new to the sport is, is wearing a waiter belt and mm-hmm. keeping it tight. Mm-hmm. Um, you can fall in and, um, uh, your waiters aren't going to turn upside down <clears throat> and fill with water, mm-hmm. but. Um, they can act like a sea anchor, and if they fill with water, you can't stand up because they're they're too heavy, mm-hmm. and you you can flounder around. I fell in this winter time. This winter it was very Ooh. cold, and yeah. I fell in, and I'm in good shape. I do a lot of waiting. I do a lot of weight training and exercise. Um, <clears throat> I've done it all my life, and I had trouble getting up. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, and I was in fairly shallow water and it wasn't dangerous, but I can imagine if I was in the middle of a big fast river and I didn't have my waiter belt on and the water went all the way down and soaked mm-hmm. my wallet and my phone wow. and all that stuff. If you are a waiter belt and you cinch it tight, chances are, if you take a little spill, you're only going to be wet on top, mm-hmm. not on the bottom. Um, so <clears throat> it's really important. Mm-hmm. Can, uh, can I add a quick anecdote to that? Yeah. This past weekend, I was participating in the one bug tournament and uh, a fellow contestant was, was, you know, had just gotten off in the middle of the day to go take a quick break on land and was trying to get back on. And the water was at 4,500 CPS. He was probably in his 60s and just slipped and went rapidly down river. And thankfully, his son could get in to help him. But I, you know, we were all talking about the fact that his waiter belt was tight for that exact. And so I think it can even happen when you're not waiting and be very useful. So I think that's a, a great point. In a waiting staff, you know, you can get collapsible waiting staffs that you can just hang on your belt, hang on your waiter belt. And um, if you don't need it, you, it's just there. Um, <laughs> if you, but if you do need it, you can take it out quickly and, and they, you know, they automatically open up. Um, having that third leg, having that tripod, it's, is. <laughs> It's great. And if you don't have a waiting staff um, and you need to cross some some really serious water and you're not quite mm-hmm. sure, um, just grab a nice stout stick from the bank. I do it all. I do it all the time because I, I don't carry a waiting staff and mm-hmm. um, I'll just grab a stick from the bank and use yeah. it for a waiting staff. Yeah. Yeah. I do the same. Just a, just yeah. a stick. Yeah. Yeah. Just a stick. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Great. Hmm. Yeah, I can see a lot of people talking about waiter belts being critical and it's tough to get out when you fall in. Yeah, it's really mm-hmm. very, yeah. very difficult. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you see this question about where to keep your waiting staff? I think that's a good one because I, I actually don't know the answer to that either. Hmm. I have one that uh, just is, is in a little lanyard and it, my waiter belt goes through it. Hmm. I've um I don't have a waiting stick, but I've um I attach my net my net um with a carabiner and that just goes to my either my belt loop um 
I have also have the Orvis waiter. Um, well, I actually use the belt. I don't really use the um, the loop. I use the belt um, and or my bag. I'll attach it to my bag. Mm -hmm. You can stick it down the back of your waiters too. They're collapsible, so you get you could even stick it. Well, that wouldn't be good because it'd be tough to get to probably. But yeah. <laughs> Uh, Mike, you know, Mike, it depends on what kind of waiting staff you have. You know, a lot of them come in a little neoprene lanyard or something, but um, that goes on your belt. If you don't have that, then you use a carabiner. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the side loops are on the uh, pro waiters are strong enough to hold a hold a waiting staff, so you can yeah. do that. I like this question by Victor Cross. Um, can you catch fish standing on the bank? Absolutely. <laughs> Yes, mm -hmm. you yeah. don't have to, um, you know, sometimes when I don't have that much time and I don't have time to wait her up and all that stuff, I'll just kind of, um, yeah, hit the banks and whatnot. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, and in small streams, sometimes you don't mm -hmm. want to get in the water. You just fish in the bank. You know, it, mm -hmm. it, 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 it depends because if there's a lot of brush along the banks, it makes it really difficult. Once you get mm -hmm. in the middle of the river, you have a lot more room. So uh, it, it is it, it can be difficult, but you can absolutely catch fish standing on the bank. Yeah, mm -hmm. we all do it. Right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the other thing is that, you know, if you only fish during the summertime and the water, you know, water's nice and refreshing, um, you don't always need waders. Uh, you mm -hmm. can do what we call wading wet. And it's probably a good idea to get a pair of wading shoes because they'll have uh, special rubber or felt soles or you could uh, put studs in them and mm -hmm. they're going to give you more security on the bottom. But you know, once June rolls around, or even late May, um, mm -hmm. I'm out of my waders. I would just wear a pair of quick dry nylon pants, and um, you know, I won't wear waders again till the fall usually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same. <laughs> yeah, so you don't always need to have waders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I used to just kind of go around in my chacos when it was high summer. You know, really warm outside and. Um, now I use neoprene socks and wading shoes and that way I can kind of stay in the water a little bit longer and feeling yeah. more confident with my feet um, planting. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my system that I use now. Yeah. Chacos are not the greatest for wading. You bump yeah. your toes and uh, yeah. yeah. And they don't have, they don't have the, they don't have the Michelin rubber sole. On them, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, but if you're just getting started, right? That's yeah. yeah. <laughs> I made make it work it for a couple of years. Make, make it simple at first, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you ever weigh downstream or just upstream? That's a good question. Mike, with all the good questions today. Yeah. <laughs> I like fishing upstream. I don't know. I and this is kind of my perspective is you know most fish are looking upstream and so whenever it does hook i'm able to kind of set backwards um but i've also kind of been playing around with downstream especially with streamers um so it just kind of depends um i'd say streamer fishing probably down and then mostly up if it's nymphs or or dries mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah it really um depends on how you want to present the fly what fly you're using mike and um, uh, often in bigger rivers um, I'll, I'll work downstream just because it, it may be hard to push against the current and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll wade downstream close to the bank. So I don't, you know, don't get in trouble so that, so that when I get to the end of where I'm going to fish, I can get out of the river and walk back. Um, mm -hmm. but in a really big river, I'll, um, I'll often fish, fish downstream, even with a dry fly and just mm -hmm. throw a slack line cast or a reach cast or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. All right. Oh my God, it's 20 after four. Yeah, I'm about ready to get back out on the water, Tom. Oh, I'm sorry to keep you from your fishing. We, well, we had such good questions that we, I didn't want to stop. No, these are great questions. Yes, um, I really yeah. appreciate it, everyone. And sorry if we didn't get to your question, but um, yeah, this was good. I learned a lot. I actually have some notes that you taught me, Tom. So thank you. Oh, wow. Well, you know, I learned from you too. I learned from you, especially... Um, you know, I learn from every time I talk to another angler, I learn and I learned about, about thinking about who was the original caretaker of the land. And I am going to make that part of my, part of my procedure, um, when I go to the water, I'm going to get that app and I'm going to use it. So 
That's awesome. a great, great idea. And really add, will add a dimension to anyone's fishing, I think. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Great. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in today. Thank you for the great questions. Um, I hope some of you learned something that'll, you know, give you a little more confidence, make, make you have more fun on the stream and you're, you're going to have more fun when you're, when you have a little more confidence. And, um, you know, if you have any, uh, if you have any questions that you'd like to see us address that are basic, um, cause we have other venues for more advanced topics. Um, mm -hmm. you can, um, you know, uh, send your post it on, uh, the Orvis Facebook page, Orvis fly fishing, Facebook page or Instagram. And, um, you know, give us some ideas for, um, for some, for some, for some other topics that you'd like to hear about. Yeah. Cause we're and here, we're, we're here to help. We're here to help you have fun. We're here once a month, every first Thursday. <laughs> yep. We are. We are. <laughs> so we'll see you next month, Tom. <laughs> okay, Erica. Get out there and get out there and go fishing. It's only, oh, it's only 20 after two. You get the best part of the day out there. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, get fishing. Um, thank Thanks. you again, everyone. And um, Eric and I will see you in a month. Yep. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Bye, Tom. Bye. Bye.